Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. During the Cenozoic, between the beginning of the Paleocene about 65 million years ago to the Pliocene circa 3 million years ago, South America was a semi-isolated island continent with highly distinctive and endemic animal groups, much like modern Australia. I've covered several of these on this channel before, including the flightless carnivorous terror birds, the metatherian sporacidonts, and the terrestrial predatory Cebacosuchians. However, one lineage that I've neglected so far are the highly successful notoungulates, the most diverse members of South America's unique ungulate assemblage. Often placed into the wastebasket category of Meridiungulata, which encompasses a disparate array of hoofed placental mammals that probably have quite different evolutionary origins, including the horse and camel-like Litopterns, the poorly understood Xenungulates, and the bulky, superficially elephant-like pyrotheres. The notoungulates themselves were a diverse and common bunch, with species ranging from small rabbit-like hoppers to massive rhino or hippo-like animals. They first appear in the fossil record about 61 million years ago during the Paleocene, and persisted until the end of the last glacial period 12,000 years ago. Diversifying during the Eocene, notoungulates can generally be divided into early basal forms and two main lineages, with these being the small rodent and rabbit-like typotheres and the larger, bulkier toxodonts. Many of these animals had no exact modern analogues, especially among hoofed ungulates, with some demonstrating high levels of convergence with perissodactyls. In fact, preserved collagen samples obtained from the youngest of notoungulates have shown that these animals were probably a sister lineage to perissodactyls, with an estimated divergence time of roughly 66 million years ago. Although some recent morphological studies have found notoungulates to be aphrotheres, related to hyrax and elephants, I am personally wary of such results based on morphology alone, as this has led to many classification errors in the past based on superficial similarities, such as the grouping of pangolins with xenarthrans, bats with primates, and tenracs with shrews, moles, and hedgehogs. Genetic testing has also shown that notoungulates were close relatives of litopterns, with the ancestors of both probably island hopping into South America from the north around the time of the Cretaceous-Paleocene boundary. During the late Cretaceous and early Paleocene, we know that some kind of tenuous connection between these continents was present, due to the sudden occurrence of the Titanosaur Alamosaurus in southern Laramidia, the presence of hadrosaurs and ankylosaurs of North American origin in Maastrichtian Argentina, as well as the arrival of metatherian mammals by the beginning of the Paleocene. After the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, the ancestors of the notoungulates would gradually diversify and would later become the most successful herbivorous mammals in South America, at least until the second half of the Miocene. The earliest and most basal notoungulates first appear during the Paleocene roughly 61 million years ago. These have sometimes been divided up into the families Henricos Borneidae and Notostylopidae, but these may be artificial groupings. Early forms include the rabbit-sized Simpsonodus, which is known from mid to late Paleocene deposits in northern Argentina. Its teeth are among the most generalised of all notoungulates, and it has been suggested that Simpsonodus' own relatives were close to the common ancestry of all later members of the clade. In life, it was probably a vaguely chevrotain like animal, albeit with a long tail and an unspecialised omnivorous diet. Another well-known early notoungulate was the genus Notostylops, which was native to Argentina across the Eocene period, a small and very generalised animal about the size of a raccoon, Notostylops possessed moderate adaptations for digging and enlarged rodent-like incisors for snipping soft, low-growing plants. It was stocky in build and would have resembled other basal ungulate-like placentals, such as the pantodonts and tilodonts with the closest modern comparison probably being to wombats. It has been suggested that the enigmatic pyrotheres, which would later develop into massive, superficially elephant-like browsers, were close relatives of Notostylops. The two share large forward-pointing incisors and bulky builds, although this relationship is still considered controversial, with the exact placement of the pyrotheres still being uncertain, so I won't be going into detail on them here. By the end of the Paleocene, such basal forms had given rise to the typotheres and toxodonts, the former of which I'll be covering first. 
These were a fairly diverse but conservative lineage of Notto ungulates, which generally remained small and included members that would have superficially resembled rodents, rabbits and hyraxes. It is worth noting that the famous modern caviar morph rodents only arrived in South America around the time of the Eocene or Ligocene boundary, meaning that there were a variety of open niches for early typotheres to exploit, with minimal competition. Basal forms such as the early to mid-Eocene Colbertia were terrestrial generalist herbivores that would have resembled a cross between a hyrax and a marmot, dwelling in dense tropical forests. Colbertia itself was about the size of a Virginia opossum, and probably lived a lifestyle somewhat like that of modern packers and agoutis. From here, a number of different families emerged to fill a variety of different ecological niches. The Interotheriids appeared during the Middle Eocene, and were generally the most unspecialised type of theirs, although of course there were exceptions. Early forms such as Notopithecus were small, long-bodied, long-tailed animals that would have looked almost squirrel-like, albeit with teeth well adapted for feeding on soft vegetation. Some later forms kept this sort of appearance, such as the early Oligocene Santogorothea from Chile. About the size of a small dog, and weighing between 5 and 7 kilograms, this genus would have been a quick, agile, and possibly gregarious animal, with molars equipped for processing tougher plant material. The successful Interotherium, which gives its name to the whole family, lived on the savannas of early Miocene Argentina, a very small form comparable to an American mink in terms of size. Interotherium also possessed a somewhat mustard-like body plan, complete with a long torso, short legs, and claw-like hooves. Its body shape would have allowed the animal to hide in underground burrows, although the limbs do not show any major adaptations for digging. It probably fed on leaves, fallen fruit, and grasses close to the ground, with it being suggested that Interotherium may have lived close to water. If so, this small skittish herbivore perhaps leapt into streams and rivers in order to escape predatory sporacidonts and terror birds. Whatever its lifestyle was, this odd animal would have looked nothing like any modern ungulate that we are familiar with, highlighting some of the divergent paths taken by hoofed mammals in South America. More derived interotheriids experimented with more specialised habits, such as the somewhat rabbit-like prototypotherium. This was among the most successful of all notoungulates, first appearing during the late Oligocene about 25 million years ago, and persisting until the late Miocene circa 6.8 million years ago. Up to 13 species are known across the southern cone of South America, with a flexible diet that may have included both plants and carrion, long slender legs and digitigrade feet adapted for digging, Prototype Ethereum clearly thrived in many different ecosystems. Resembling a long-legged Viscasha, this agile animal would have been able to run away from predators, retreating back into its burrow. The closely related middle Miocene genus Myocochelius took cursorial adaptations further, possessing a reduced number of hoof-like toes on each foot, with three-toed front feet and two-toed hind feet. It was the largest in Terotheriid, being about the size of a muntjac deer, and would have somewhat resembled one as well, albeit lacking horns and possessing a long tail. Myocochelius would have lived in semi-open woodland or shrubland habitats, browsing on tough, low-growing plants. Other type of theers, such as sued hyrax, were, as the name suggests, hyrax-like animals, but were larger than these modern afrotheres, and possessed high-crowned molars for chewing on tough plants. Meanwhile, the hegetotheriids were very rabbit-like, with some forms even developing large thumping hind feet in order to bound away from predators. Pachyrucos from the early to middle Miocene was a good example, being about 30 centimetres or just under a foot long, with a very short tail and limbs adapted for hopping and leaping. Its eyes were notably large, suggesting that it may have been nocturnal, with the complexity of its auditory apparatus meaning that this genus had an acute sense of hearing, and perhaps even prominent rabbit-like ears. While the typotheres generally declined during the second half of the Miocene, probably as a result of a cooling and drying climate, as well as potential competition from caviomorph rodents, Hegetotheria is persisted into the late Pleistocene, withstanding the impact of the Great American Interchange for a couple of million years. The hair-like genus Tremacelus dwelt on the open pampas of Argentina until potentially as recently as 12,000 years ago, when it died out during the end Pleistocene extinction event. Another late surviving lineage of Typotheres were the Mesotheriids, 
which were the biggest and burliest members of the clade. First appearing during the late Oligocene, these animals evolved in response to the cooling and drying trends of Oligocene South America by adapting to fossorial niches in open environments, with their remains being largely restricted to the Altiplano region of Chile and Bolivia, with proportionally large skulls, powerful robust jaws, and ever-growing incisors and molars. Mesotherids were well adapted for digging in search of roots and tubers. Their forelimbs were strong and well muscled, with these animals somewhat resembling modern wombats and marmots. The youngest known member of the group was the genus Mesotherium, with a predominantly grazing diet due to its wide muzzle allowing for bulk feeding. Mesotherium persisted into the Middle Pleistocene about 22,000 years ago, and was the largest of all typotheres, being about the size of a sheep and weighing between 55 and 100 kilograms, or 121 to 220 pounds. Why the Mesotheriates died out at this time is not well understood, but it may have been due to the cooling of global ecosystems, which caviar morph rodents were better adapted to survive. The other major lineage of notoungulates were the Toxodonts, which took a very different path than their small typothere cousins. United by features of the teeth, auditory structures, and particular tarsal adaptations of the feet, these animals first became common during the second half of the Eocene, although they originated during the late Paleocene. Basal members of Toxodontia have often been grouped into the family Isotemnidae, but this is probably a wastebasket classification. Many are known only from dental fossils, with the genus Thomas Huxleya certainly being the most well-known form. Native to the early Eocene of Argentina about 48 million years ago, this genus was a pig-sized generalist omnivore with stocky proportions, weighing in at an estimated 113 kilograms or 249 pounds. It possessed a full set of unspecialized teeth, including large canines which may have been used to root around in the soil. It was the not ungulate equivalent of modern South American peccaries, while more derived toxodonts would become increasingly specialized towards exclusive herbivory. Another relatively basal family were the Homalodotheriids, which are native to Chile and Argentina from the early Oligocene to the late Miocene, thriving as South America's forests opened up into dry savanna and bushland. These animals demonstrate strong convergence with the Calicotheres of the Northern Hemisphere, being heavy-set browsing herbivores with clawed feet and having the ability to stand on their hind legs in order to reach leaves and branches. The genus Homalodotherium is the most famous, living in early to middle Miocene Argentina and Chile, resembling a cross between a bear and a ground sloth. Measuring about 2 meters long and weighing 300 kilograms or 660 pounds, it would have been a slow-moving high browser that defended itself from predatory terror birds and metatherians with its powerful clawed forelimbs. Its close relative Chassicotherium was the youngest member of this family and also the largest, weighing in at at least a ton, and inhabiting what is now Buenos Aires in Argentina during the late Miocene between 9 and 10 million years ago. More derived toxodonts tended to possess heavier, more firmly quadrupedal builds, and would have somewhat resembled modern rhinos. An early example were the Leontinids, which thrived from the Middle Eocene to the late Miocene. With bulky bodies and teeth better adapted for processing tough plant matter, they were certainly not built for speed, and would have preferred at least partially forested environments in order to feed and hide from predators. The best ecological comparison would be the smaller modern rhinos, tapirs, and the extinct diprotodonts of Australia. One genus, Talbatherium, was taller and leggier than most members of the family, being more well adapted for feeding on high-growing vegetation. This gregarious animal, about the size of a pony, also possessed notable sexual dimorphism and probably gregarious, living in herds near the ancient Brazilian lake beds in which its fossils were found. Another group of early toxodonts, the notohippids, have recently been found to be an unnatural grouping and are more of a grade leading up to the true toxodontids. Although their name means southern horses, this is quite misleading, as these animals did not resemble modern horses at all. Instead, they would have looked more like very early equids or brontotheres, not being particularly well adapted for running. The similarities to horses lie in their teeth, which were suited for chewing tough vegetation including grasses. Famous forms include the genus Rhynchippus from the late Oligocene, which was about the size of a sheep 
and weighed up to 120 kilograms or 260 pounds. While being a heavy set animal, its slender limbs have enabled Rinchippus and relative to be quite agile and fast over short distances. From forms similar to this developed the first of the Toxodontids proper during the late Oligocene, which were larger and more massive than their ancestors. As would be expected, basal forms were the smallest and least specialised, with genera such as Adenotherium from the later Miocene being pig-sized animals that fed mostly on leaves, supplementing their diet with fruit and tree bark. However, its close relative Nestodon was substantially more massive, standing about 1.5 metres tall at the shoulder and weighing in at 554 kilograms or 1,221 pounds. Although its molars were high crowned, dental wear patterns show that it was still a predominantly browsing genus, reflecting the more heavily forested conditions of early Miocene South America. As the continent dried out and grasslands spread as the period progressed, the Toxodontids continued to expand in size with their teeth becoming ever more specialised. More derived forms became increasingly rhino-like, albeit with jaws and teeth that were highly distinctive, with forward pointing incisors, very deep jaw muscles for heavy chewing, and high crowned molars. Some species may have even possessed horns. Hofstetterius imperator lived in Bolivia during the late Miocene, about 11 to 5 million years ago. Standing about 1.6 metres tall, it had a particularly oddly shaped skull, with a deep downward flaring lower jaw and a large bulging shield on its forehead that resembled the attachment points for horns in modern rhino skulls. As this structure would have been composed of keratin, we do not know what the horn would have looked like. This animal would have lived much like a modern black rhino, inhabiting open savanna woodlands and feeding on shrubs and low-growing trees. It was closely related to the highly successful genus Toxodon, which as far as we know lacked a horn. Emerging during the late Miocene and persisting until the late Pleistocene about 11,000 years ago, this was one of the most common large mammals of its time and was among the youngest of all notoungulates. Standing about 1.5 metres tall and possessing a heavy barrel-shaped body with short, stout legs, Toxodon would have superficially resembled the extinct North American rhino Teleoceras. Weighing up to 1.5 tonnes, Toxodon was an adaptable animal capable of living in a variety of ecosystems, from open pampas to tropical forest. With its wide mouth, cropping incisors and ever-growing molars, allowing it to consume both leaves, twigs, bark and grasses. Like living hippos, studies have shown that this animal would have been surprisingly fast over short distances, but unlike them, Toxodon was a firmly terrestrial herbivore. Despite the arrival of new carnivoran predators during the Pliocene, this hardy beast continued to thrive, demonstrating that South America's endemic mammals were not inherently primitive or inferior to their northern analogues. Like many of the megafaunal animals in the Americas, Toxodon died out about 12,000 years ago, for reasons that are still highly debated, but may have included a combination of climate change and human interference. Another late surviving Toxodont was a genus Mixotoxodon, which was the only Notoanga to successfully spread into North America during the Pleistocene, with remains having been recovered from much of Central America and as far north as southern Texas. This animal would have generally resembled its relative Toxodon, but possessed a narrower skull and was notably more massive, standing about 6 feet tall at the shoulder and weighing up to 3.8 tons. Like other members of the family, it would have had flexible eating habits, being able to feed on shrubs, leaves and grasses as the situation demanded. It died out at about the same time as Toxodon, during the extinction event at the end Pleistocene, although as stated earlier, the reasons for this are still very much debated. I like to think that both Toxodon and Mixotoxodon may have survived into modern times if humans never entered the Americas, as their generalised feeding habits and clear adaptability may have helped them to pull through, although this may just be wishful thinking on my part. Regardless, the notoungulates are now entirely extinct, but we can at least look back and marvel at their diversity and to our eyes bizarre adaptations being hoofed mammals that sometimes possessed claws, rodent-like incisors, and mustard-like body plans. Thanks for watching everyone. The next video will be covering the early history of Proboscideans, so until then I'll see you again soon. Cheerio!